I've been thinking more and more recently that that whole narrative on LinkedIn about you know don't work for a CEO who doesn't get marketing. I think it's don't work for founders who don't love the problem more than they love the product. Did you just think of that, or did you were you sitting on that one? Because that's money. I I never worded it that way. So that was all, <laughs> oh yeah, full credit. I've heard that before. I have to give a shout out to Robert at Scale. We, yeah, he says that too. Love the problem more than the product. Here's what go-to-market teams are missing. Proof. That's what I think of every morning when I fire up LinkedIn and scroll through boring manifestos and endless lukewarm takes. Opinions are cheap and proof is gold. I'm Mark Huber and this is The Proof Point, a show from user evidence that helps go-to-market teams find ideas, get frameworks, and swap tactics. Each episode includes an unfiltered discussion with the biggest names in B2B SaaS to help find the proof points that I'm in search of. You'll learn from sales, marketing, and customer success leaders in the trenches, where I ask them, seriously, what actually works for you? One of our guests actually told me this felt like we were having drinks at a bar and talking about work without all the BS. And that pretty much sums it up and why I'm so excited for this new show. Join us every other week for new episodes. Hot takes, always welcome. On this week's episode of The Proof Point, we talk about brand awareness and creating demand and how a lot of people use those terms interchangeably when they don't mean the same thing. First up, he's the founder of a new agency called Storybook Marketing, Liam Maroney. He's somebody who I've gotten to know on LinkedIn over the years. I even bought him a really bad Christmas sweater last year and made him wear it online. And he was a really good sport about it all. Next up, She's a new CMO and actually a four-time CMO at a company called G2. I think you may have heard of it before, Sydney Sloan. She brought a ton of amazing stories and experience from all of her years working at big startups like Drata and Sales Loft, uh, and now G2 as well. And last but definitely not least, the guy who actually inspired this episode topic with his LinkedIn drawings, Sam Keenly. He's a VP of marketing at Luxo and somebody that I've known here and there over the years and actually got to work with for a bit when he was at Refine Labs and I was at my last company. We went long on this topic and for good reason, the discussion was that good. Enjoy. All righty. So Liam, I feel like if you read LinkedIn every day or every week, like many of us do, including the group on this podcast, you'll see that people talk about brand awareness and demand creation as the same thing. Is that the case? I do not think that is the case. I, I'm a little bit of, um, I don't want to call it a, a, a nemesis of the term demand creation, but I do think that the term brand awareness is largely either misunderstood or is put into way too small of a box for what it actually is. And I think my, my belief of why that is, is because I think that brand has not historically been a big aspect of the SaaS tech world. I think it's, we, we are not typically a long-term thinking industry because so much of the industry has been about exits as quickly as possible, going from raise to raise. Long-term is not exactly part of the DNA of the industry. And so brand awareness and brand building is kind of the minority in a lot of the cases. It's largely about driving pipeline, driving leads, driving new near-term business. And I think that what has happened was that that part of the world got bigger and bigger. Demand generation, when I first started it, was a lead generation function. Its job was to get leads, nurture leads, convert leads. That was what it was. And then it got bigger, not for any sort of land grab, but because I think it was trying to fill a gap that was very obviously there when you're trying to do long-term growth, which is you need to have some form of a brand to drive and extract demand from. And I think it started to blend together. So this idea of demand creation, I think, became synonymous. But I don't think they're the same thing. I think that in reality, brand awareness, and I think where it gets undersold, it's not simply what do you do and maybe why do you do it. It is also the and why you should choose it. I think it goes farther than just pure awareness and recall. I think brand awareness drives revenue, and I think it's perceived to not and I think we think that demand creation is the extension of getting it to turn into revenue. And I think that's not true. So before we get into the meat of it, I got a funny question and to actually kick us off now. So Sam, I'll get into what inspired this, but have you always been a drawer? How long do these drawings take? Like what goes into this? Tell me like what's happening before you have your first cup of coffee and you start drawing on LinkedIn. 
Yeah. I'm not notoriously known as a doodler. I wasn't in high school, wasn't in college, but I think just when I got to the B2B world, everything is always so overcomplicated, right? It's people want to sound as smart as possible. Let's use jargon. Let's use acronyms. Let's talk about streamlining your God knows what. And like just using these big words that don't make sense to overcomplicate. And I've always been on the mindset, like if I can reduce something to, to simple terms that I can understand, that's when it finally clicks for me. Cause it's like getting rid of all the noise of understanding it. So that's what I like to do with all these concepts. And that's where I guess I have become more visual in that sense. Like if I can take this vague thing that everyone talks about it, get it on paper and a super simple doodle that my second grade art teacher would be proud of. That was really just where, where this all started. And you know, the LinkedIn algorithm liked it. So and other people liked it more than the algorithm. So I was like, okay, like this is landing with other people. It's how I teach. That's how I learn is by teaching others, so to speak. And that's why I post so much because it forces me to think and to say things concisely. So yeah, I, uh, I, I was never a good art student though, unfortunately. So, Hey, I'm glad that it, it's paid off somewhat though. <laughs> so not to put you on blast, but I know there are uh, tools that you can use, especially for direct mail where it makes it look like it's handwritten and it's not. Do you actually draw these or are you using a tool? I actually draw these. I won't nice. source that. I won't like direct <laughs> mail. I like every, every couple of weeks I send five thank you notes to new customers. I will write those. That's to me, one of those things that it just seems disingenuous to to outsource some lots like if you're going to go through the, the pain so to speak of handwriting something do it yourself right that's the whole reason that you're giving value with it so yeah all these i do it myself i tried some of the the online not figma but other alternatives where you can make it look like it's handwritten i'm like that takes more time than me just pulling out this notebook with my five dollar pen and just writing it here taking a picture and uploading it way easier that's right i'm just gonna say that's how i start my linkedin post too it's all right like ideas for posts and then take a picture of it. Um, Cause I think so too, that authenticity yeah. of like your handwriting, like just also stands out cause nobody does it. So mm -hmm. not Sam. I love it. I love it. I'm too embarrassed to draw publicly because our class was never my strong suit, but I have no shame at admitting I have a stack of 500 sheets of printer paper. I'm always just writing stuff down old school. I'd rather write it down and think through it uh, versus <laughs> type. So yep. Nice. Yeah. So he's the same way too. It works better. Yeah. <laughs> you listen too. you listen differently and yeah. Yeah. And then I translate it totally. Absolutely. I am old right. school though. <laughs> so Sam, we'll overlay the graphic that really uh, inspired this post, but I want you to walk me through what you drew, how you explained it, and then we'll have uh, really the fun part of the discussion from there. It stemmed from a conversation I was having with Justin Norris on his podcast. We were talking about YouTube ads, and I'll go down this rabbit hole in a second. But it basically got into brand awareness, demand creation, everything that everyone's talking about. And our conversation led us to talking about Monday.com. Basically, there was a point in time where every time you went on YouTube, you would just see Monday.com all the time. All the time. I, I couldn't open anything without it could be a cat video. Not that I watch cat videos all the time. It could be marketing related. It didn't matter like what, how you were segmented. That's what was going to show up. And so I quickly learned, I'm like, hey, Monday.com is a company. Great. I know who they are. Monday.com is a project management tool. Great. I know exactly what they do. But in the course of all those ads, they never really said like how they were different than any of the other project management tools, like what their strong point of view was or any element of differentiation. It was basically just like Monday.com project management over and over and over beating me to death with that. And to this day, I use Asana or I use Basecamp. Those are the two that I've done because Monday.com might be better, but I align with the other ones or they never given me a compelling reason to want to move. And so we were talking about monday.com youtube ads and it was basically just like this saturation effect that they created brand awareness they absolutely created brand awareness i know who they are i knew what they did but where we started getting to it's like well why didn't you ever buy them why didn't you ever use them and that's where we got this little aha moment of like they never created demand with me in that like what was compelling about them why did i want to choose them and that's where i started to say like oh this is interesting as we're talking through this like What's brand awareness at its simplest terms? Liam's probably going to rip my head off for this. I, I want to get his thoughts on it. But it's like, okay, I know what you do as a company and I know why I should choose you. And that's how I oversimplified brand awareness. And I was like, okay, well, how do I make someone want to choose me? So when they do come to market, when they are ready to purchase, they do that. And that's where I was like, that's the extra step that demand creation answers. So I want to stop for a second because I know this is probably going to be one of the best parts of the conversation, getting Liam to be like, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. Here's where you're right. Here's where you're wrong. I don't know what it is, but like that was the oversimplified version of it. Before I even get into that, I actually 
don't fully agree that monday.com didn't do a really good job early on. I think their problem was they changed their positioning, their messaging, and their product, and it got progressively worse. It turned into exactly what it was supposed to be competing against. Because I I did buy monday.com at like two companies to replace Reich and to replace Asana, and it was because I loved their advertising. They had subway ads, and I, I think they did these regionally because I saw them in New York and I saw them in London where they had like, at the time they were very topical. They had ads that were like the, um, there was a New York City mayor race and they were like organizing New York using like an interface. So you saw what the product did. It was very clever. There was a prime minister race in England at the time and they were like stack ranking them and they were funny. They were good ads, but they also showed how the product worked. I actually thought they did a stellar job. And I think its benefit was that it got it had, to me, the demand came from the fact that it was easy to use, incredibly easy to onboard. And then like a year later, it stopped being that. It turned into a very corporate program because they added features nobody was asking for. They were trying to make it enterprise friendly, which was everybody's failure. Like, I think they did a great job early on. I think their problem, if I were being genuinely academic, it's that they they were not practicing what would be a typical 4P strategy at all. Their product was being invented by somebody other than customer insight. It was being invented by investor value. It was being like, you know, enterprise opportunity. I think that's where they went wrong, not in their inability to articulate why monday.com. Interesting. And so you said they started to go up market more to enterprise. Did they go broader with their overall, like we're for everyone? Did they start to do a little bit more oh, of that they, too? They went with the generic headline topic of, I can't remember, it was something nonsense jargony, like, you know, organize everything or some absolutely yeah. meaningless term. Like you could list the amount, it wasn't even monday.com did this. Drift did this. Um, like everyone did this. They end up turning into the exact opposite to what made them originally interesting. So that's one of the biggest things I look at with demand creation and brand awareness is like, who are you messaging with or like what audience are you going after with your messaging? Because I find brand awareness is like talking to your TAM, anyone who could possibly use it. Whereas I say demand creation, that's specific to your ICP. Who are the actual people who would use it, would buy it? Not everyone at a company that could, but it really is getting more detailed, prescriptive. Because that's a layer where I always say like, yeah, Monday.com, they, they did that. They went up market. They went to all these places and they, they tried to broaden out their messaging to where it became relevant-ish to anyone who could buy it, but not really to the people who were their core users, the 80% of people that probably make up their revenue. So Sydney, you're by my account, a four times CMO. I'm not a math guy, but is that correct? Yeah, all in one hand. <laughs> So how does this compare to like how you think of this at the executive level? Because if you go into board meetings and you're just talking about brand awareness the whole time and it's not, you know, creating demand, I'm sure you might not be in a, the best of spots. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I started my career at Adobe. Actually, I started my career at a very small company that Adobe acquired. And so when I think about the power of brand, I mean, Adobe's brand is one of the best in the world. Uh, and I remember where you know our our sellers before we were acquired couldn't get a call with our buyers like they would they would try everything and this is a while ago before all the new tools come out but they tried everything and then as ma magically we get to adobe and they can get a call with anybody anybody and it was just this huge shining moment now of course everybody that they were reaching out to just wanted a copy of photoshop so they just bring the box with them and put it on the desk and say now let's talk about our enterprise products but you saw the power of brand and its ability to open doors. I call it like the red carpet. Like we're rolling out the red carpet, building a brand. So our sellers and buyers can meet each other, you know, easily. And having been in some very competitive mar markets, so the sales loft versus outreach battle, the most recently Vanta versus Drata, you know, that, that power for brand supremacy was real. And it, it gets you in the door. If you do a great job of associating your brand with the problem that's trying to be solved in your buyer's mind. So I, I agree with the TAM almost because you still do want to have that affinity in with the, the buyer in that world. So um, I might take it down one step into ICP to get to the buyer piece. And you know, th then you get invited to the party and hopefully that you're invited first. By the time we left, I left sales off, like 70% of our net new business was coming inbound. 
And when you don't have to pay for, uh, for your branded search terms anymore, you know you've won. When it comes to the executive level, and those were questions that the board wanted to know, is like, is your brand stronger? You know, why aren't you investing as much in brand? Uh, was, you know, because your competitors are doing it and, and they're always the first in the door. And my answer to that is if we don't know who we are yet, like if we haven't really solidified our brand, the one that we're willing to put all our investment into and our, our founders, or our executives are comfortable being that company for the next five years. I don't want to start investing in that yet. So that hard work of really establishing who am I, like we were talking about, what do I, what do we stand for as a company? beyond the products we sell, that's an exercise that leadership needs to go through so you can show up consistently. And, you know, thankfully I'm at G2 now. I think our brand is very strong. We do know what we stand for. It resonates with buyers and sellers. And so that's not an investment I have to make to establish the brand, but I do still need to make the investment to keep the brand relevant in the in the buyer's minds or in the seller's minds in my world, like it's end users and the companies that we sell to. So it's a bit of a different brand challenge for me personally, which I love, but ho hopefully that path through all the brands that I work for and like the challenges, but I, I am brand wins every day and companies don't invest early enough in building their brand. So they pay way more in the long term in demand capture. It's just like, it's bad math. I have a bad tendency to get like foxhole into, oh, I'm the academic marketer. Or I'll go back to the textbooks. And and I do truthfully, but I do think that like for my personal experience of coming into SaaS was that I had gone to college for marketing. I had a very textbook idea and I went and I was in B2B for a few years until I went into B2B tech and then into B2B SaaS. And then I was sort of effectively told none of that stuff applies here anymore. Put it away. There's a whole different world here. And it was a different type, like all new acronyms, all new sort of styles of marketing. What I've come to feel in the last year and a half, two years, certainly, is that the more I look outside of SaaS and I look at the more traditional, classic marketing approaches that other industries are taking, especially B2C, it's still very applicable to what's going on right now. It's just that we don't seem to like connect the dots on it. Because a lot of what you've said, I think it matches all the theory, like exactly matches most of the theory. Like you look at the you know, Bennett and Field theory about brand building and sort of like brand versus act activation, all of the kind of like, you know, textbook stuff, it follows exactly what you're saying that you, the theory generally that I've subscribed to is that brand awareness alone can grow a business. It just doesn't efficiently do it very well. Whereas demand generation, lead generation, demand capture, whatever you call it, done alone cannot grow. It hits a plateau very, very quickly. And the math bottoms out very, very quickly. And the main reason we haven't seen that as much in SaaS is because it was buried in VC funding where you could run at extraordinarily inefficient paces and never be found out. So you could lead gen your way to growth and you just look at the customer acquisition cost and go, oh, that's like ridiculous. It was like that Scott Galloway thing when he wrote the original post about Casper mattresses where it turns out for every mattress they were selling, they were losing $300. And he said it would have been better to just stuff a bag full of $300 and send it to people than sell them the mattress. That's the reality of the unit economics. And I think when you pull back and that's not there, you don't have that cushion, you have, brand is the only way you can grow. Like it's it's genuinely, and like like you said, you it gets you in the room, but you can't buy your way into the room unless you've got deep, deep pockets and lots of ability to run at a loss for years. I'll add one more point of view there, Liam, um, in the B2B SaaS tech world, uh, which you know, I've buried in for the last 20 years. I think the, the extra challenge there, and, and you know, it's like bringing a B2C mindset to B2B brand building is really critical. And that means you're building brand for people. And, and I always like to think like, what's the lifestyle brand? How do I connect with people? And so often I think founders don't, you know, they don't come from this world and they love their product so much. And so how many websites do you go to where the product is front and center, even money.com, you were just saying, it was all about the product and it's not about the people. And I think that you, you know, how do you build a connection, a meaningful connection when you're staring at a product UI versus, you know, feel, getting the feeling. I always say that a brand is like touches every sense. I want it to smell, taste, sound, all of it. 
the same every time one a, a potential customer has an interaction with it. I, I literally make candles for every company I work for because I want it to smell the same. And so that I think is another part of this challenge of like really building a meaningful brand that stands for something because of this affinity for product that some people can't get over. I think it's such a good point because I think I've been thinking more and more recently that that whole narrative on LinkedIn about, you know, don't work for a CEO who doesn't get marketing. I think it's don't work for founders who don't love the problem more than they love the product. Did you just think of that? Or did you, were you sitting on that one? Cause that's money. I had never worded it that way. So that was off. Oh, I, yeah. to full credit I've heard that before. I have to give a shout out to Robert at scale. We've, yeah, he says that too. Love the problem more than the product. And, and if you're doing a workshop, like, you know, just, it, it's so true. So true. There is, you'll have to listen to this. Um, Yuri Levine over at Waze, he wrote a book on this. I listened to, I think it was one of Lenny's podcasts or something like that. But the title of it is, before I completely butcher this, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Oh, and it's this that. exact concept. Like, yeah, go listen to that podcast. Can't recommend it highly enough. I know it just completely took us on a small tangent, but to your point, like the best founders, and this is what he always talks about all the time. Like when he looks at it from a venture standpoint, from a company he wants to start, he's just like, I don't love the problem. If I don't get fully interested in it, I'm not excited about it. I'm not going to go spend my time there. And I think that says a lot about it. And I think when you look at the brands who everyone aspires to be in the B2C world, they all exhibit that. Zappos wrote a literal book on customer obsession. You know, I mean, uh, Amazon is very, very customer obsessed. Apple is very customer obsessed, like down to the feature and experience and box opening. Like customer obsession and problem obsession is the norm in very successful B2C companies. It has mm -hmm. to be. Yeah, I think literally the of... next episode that goes live of this next week is about customer obsession with Jill Rowley, Mark Organ, and Evan Huck, my boss and CEO. So that is uh, perfectly unplanned. I love it. <laughs> Small tea up. So what do you think though about, there's no, I'll call it like a POV obsession because everyone has to dilute like, oh, we can't say that. We can't put it on our website. We can't turn off this one small segment. Everyone's worried about getting canceled, saying the wrong thing where that's why everything ends up blue talking about ROI or streamline this. Like it's so just kind of blah. Like they're really like, how many B2B companies can you name that have a point of view? Like Nike's commercial, like we aren't for losers or I forget the the whole concept, but, but like winning's not for everyone. Winning's yeah. Like what B2B company could put out. I didn't like, like it that. by the way. I didn't like that one. <laughs> I didn't like the spirit of <laughs> like, it I wasn't, at all. Like, well, that's not very inspiring during the Olympics, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but at least, but it, you know, I wrote the post for this and I know I got like roasted for having an opinion on it because I loved the ad and hated the message, but I loved that they had a very clear message and they have been consistent on that in previous Olympics because they had an old one, which was, you don't win silver, you lose gold. So they've already taken this position before. I don't personally like it. I think it's against the spirit of what the Olympics is, but it got them to stand out. Whether it's a successful one, whether it will alienate people, who knows? I think we we mistake standing out with being controversial. And I don't think, I think you can, there's this idea that like no one shares the content that people make in B2B because we think it's boring. We think the problems are boring, but they're interesting to the people that we sell to. It's just, it's very, the difference is it's very hard in SaaS to try and, you have to give so much context for it to make sense. When you talk about Nike, everyone gets Nike because it's Nike. It's a universal thing. But if you're working in you know, like the recruiting space, you have to go, well, you have to understand recruiters first and you have to understand their world. And let me set up the things that go in there. But like, what's interesting to them is very interesting. Like their problems are interesting. I don't think controversial is the only way to stand out. It's passionately loving the problem that they are dealing with. That makes you stand out. And making it personal and making it personal, right? It, it touches an emotion. It's, a, it's the emotional reaction that you have that builds the affinity. So I remember when I started at Sales Loft, uh, and this is back in 2018, and um, I was talking to uh, one of our investors and he's like, oh, you know, they, they do this sales love thing all the time. It's kind of weird, like using love. And, and so I'm like wired, like, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to, you know, refresh the brand. And, and it was so core to how sales loft felt like the mission statement is we're going to create a world where sellers are loved by the buyers they serve. That was the mission statement. 
And so that's what sales love meant. It was like deliver the, the, the idea of service, you know, service orientations, servant leadership, like really, and, and the way that we amplified that, which I feel very strongly about is the company loved on our employees. So they would love on our customers. And so we were an employee first company. We weren't a product first company. We we're in a sales first company. We're actually an employee first company. You know how great that feels. And when people feel great about the brand, they, the company, AKA the brand they represent, they deliver that through every single interaction. And when you're thinking about a brand experience, it's about the consistency in the way it shows up, especially through your brand ambassadors, who are your employees and your champions. And it was just a light bulb moment. Like it was so clear, like it was love. It meant something and, it, and love is an emotion and a feeling that, you know, finally we just leaned into like, absolutely, let's do it. And, and so it did stand out because like a lot of B2B companies don't talk about emotions or, you know, or love or, or hate and all these things. And, and, and what, I, what I loved about it was how we lived it. Even when we did the rebrand, it was like in 2021, I want to say, it was most important to activate our employees first. Like they were activated five months before we activated it in, in market. And we, we, we had a whole plan of going in and they were so proud. And it was just like, you know, I almost get emotional about it because it was just, it was such a defining moment at that stage of our company and the role that everybody got to play into it versus like new colors, new logo, you know, like ta-da moment. Like it wasn't, it was, it, it had to keep the emotion in the way that we moved forward as a brand and how important it was for me to make sure that everybody felt that same passion for it that that they had felt all along so emotion no, is good that. emotion so, is good and this is the perfect uh excuse to veer off script when you tell awesome stories like that so sydney did you have to kind of uh, sell that ma like massive project internally or was that something that the leadership team was already talking about walk us through that process yeah so i will say that Every brand refresh I've done coming in as a CMO has fabulously failed. Every time. <laughs> Every time. Having to draw that. Like I was ready to land it. It just fabulously failed. Like we couldn't get it right the first time. And I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it's something with me. Maybe it's something of the journey that the team needs to go through to really understand what it means. So we had done a, um, a, a my first brand effort uh, at Sales Loft back in 2018, 2019 was emotionally intelligent sales. Nobody actually knew what it meant. I thought it was brilliant. I was like, Wah. totally lost. And so it took a while for our CEO, Kyle Porter, to kind of come to come to realization that it was time. We actually had a brand infringement. We were going to register our, our brand mark globally and we couldn't do it. So it was like, ha, we have to do it. And then deciding how deep we wanted to go into it, that he was ready yet. He's like, Sydney, I have to chop down the the tree in my backyard and remove my tattoo. Like it was really hard for him because so many times the founder's brand is the company brand and you're renaming their child. And so they have to really be ready for that. And so getting them to buy into the process, the role, understanding the role that they want to play in that was huge. And, and we were, we were making that pivot point, that boring point to moving up market and being enterprise. And so we, we joked that I think he had paid $75 to like brand.com to get his first logo and used a $25 coupon. So I'm like, you know, the 50 bucks you spent, like after 10 years, it, pay, it paid back. And we knew we wanted to show up different. We knew we wanted to show a level of maturity. The company had evolved, the products had evolved and the brand had to evolve with it. And that's how we got there. Uh, but it was a, uh, we started in October and we launched in September. It was a full top to bottom, big band brand refresh, uh, 11 month project. We shut marketing down for um, a month and a half at the final stage, just to be able to execute on that last mile. You know, I don't know if I'll get another one of those again, but it was great. <laughs> that was going to be my follow-up <laughs> question, but you just answered it. <laughs> yeah. It was great. It was so much work though. I literally had to take a year and a half off after. <laughs> so Sam, I was going to say that you're new ish to your role. And then I looked at your LinkedIn profile before and you're not new to your role, but <laughs> remember back to the early days of when you started, did you have to try and sell this like approach of, you know, Hey, it's not just about, you know, increasing brand awareness, but it's converting that to demand and focusing on demand creation as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that was a big part of it, especially recruiting software. I mean, throw a rock, you're going to hit 10 different platforms out there. You think MarTech, sales tech is, is uh, concentrated. There's a lot of options out here. So yeah, how do you show up in a way that's going to help you stand out again without being blue and talking about how you're a little bit different, like or a little bit better? Like we had to play the different game, not just the better game. And luckily we had a killer product that were on the flip side of the VC, which is I think why this also works is Liam, you're talking about the like, VC money. You don't have the opportunity to play the long game with the brand. You're either getting your next round in 18 to 24 months or you're out like good luck. Whereas we've been bootstrapped and they were 10 years in before they made their first full-time marketing hire. And so they had a killer product and they were creating a new category with it. So there were some things that lined up where we had to kind of go about this in a way that then said, okay, how do we get people to know who we are without blending in with everyone else? And that meant having a little bit more of a point of view, but also educating on like, why were we different than everything else? So luckily the CEO and the CTO, the two co-founders understood this because they'd been doing founder led sales and building it by themselves for years. I mean, there were less than 50 employees by the time that I got here two years ago, they were invested in the long-term side of it. And so that's where I think that it, it panned out in the sense of, okay, how do we bridge this gap between creating brand awareness in a way that helps people understand like, yes, we're like what you use right now but different. We're not just this, or you think you want this, but you actually need that. And telling that story in a way that isn't so out there that nothing lands. They don't understand. Like, I have no idea what Loxo does even after they've just said all this stuff to like, oh, you're like the tool that I use to intake all of my applicants and applicant tracking software. But you also allow me to go and find prospective candidates and email them and do all these things as part of my day-to-day -day workflow that I realized I'm using 10 different pieces of software to do it. So how do we help guide them along that journey. And that's where we were taking a brand awareness approach to because we're like, no one's in market to buy something like this right now. They've got 10 different pieces of software that are in contracts either month to month or through the next three years. So we had to educate them as part of this and basically just showing them like there is a better way once you're ready, but you can't force people into something like that. And if we tried to do the lead gen approach, like we would have, I would have burned through, we don't have a big budget. I would have burned through my budget so fast. My CEO would have been like, why the hell did we hire this guy? He has no idea what he's doing. It's not turning into pipeline. So that's where taking the brand education side of it really panned out. And to this day, we don't have like a hard ad or anything that's like, get a demo now. We're like buyers are smart. They know how websites work. Go to the top right corner. When you want to talk to someone or try the product, you can. It's right there for you. Yes, we have BDRs. Yes, we have AEs who go and do, do work. But it's, it's really helping people come to that understanding on their own versus trying to force it prematurely. And that's what I felt like a lot of Tabangen previously was doing, was forcing people in, in too early. So it's this kind of like middle ground where the leadership was saying, cool, yeah, we're on board long term. But you know, you have to put up some W's along the way. So showing quarter over quarter, like, hey, pipeline is growing. People are sick of what they're doing right now. There just hasn't been a better way. So when they see this, they're interested. So we were able to show that and we're continuing to grow. It's been eight straight quarters of up and to the right, which is always good. But, you know, is it as fast as if we just injected a half million dollars per quarter into it? I don't know. Probably not. But we're playing the long game with it. And that's what what our, our results are aligning to. And Liam, you have a unique perspective on all of this because you're running an agency right now that probably has plenty of conversations on the same exact topic every single week. So what are you seeing from your vantage point right now on this topic? I think funny enough, um, on a personal note, I, I'm acutely aware of what it's like to run a business that needs to turn a profit immediately, which radically changes your own marketing approach. And you think very differently about attribution and sourcing and customer acquisition cost. But I do think on the customer side, we typically work with customers who are probably series C and above. So a lot of them are, are relatively mature. I think what we're seeing a lot of is how difficult it is to wean off of some of the old models. Like lead gen, I think it's, it's very easy to find a conversation on LinkedIn where everyone, no one disagrees with the idea, but no one has a better idea of how do you start to shift the folks away from it. Like I think, you know, I, I'm having a conversation now with a couple of clients who are sort of like $100 million AR kind of companies. And they're going through a very big internal conversation about, well, we tried to do all of these classic approaches. They didn't work. How do we get off that? And it's it's there's a lot of sunk costs that's very difficult to try and unwind RevOps functions and the way the attribution models are built. Like you, it, 
it's easier to say it than it is to do it. Everyone agrees in the first meeting, we should be optimizing towards getting people to hand raise organically. We're all totally on board for that. How would we do that? How long will that take? Where will that be measured? How will we prove that it actually worked? And what I'm finding a lot is that, this is certainly my opinion, but it's definitely my experience. The, the way we measure is limited. And we have a very limited set of measurement tools in SaaS that does not capture the full impact of marketing. And a perfect example of that is what you said, Sydney, that it makes sales easier. That is already a value of brand, but you can't measure that with an attribution tool because that's, it's incrementally improving the efficacy of sales. It's improving just the overall impact and effectiveness of the entire GTM motion. If more people show up to meetings, if meetings go better, if deal cycles get shorter, if win rates get higher, that's all a net product of brand, but it's very difficult to do it. And it's impossible to do it with multi-touch attribution. It's impossible to do it with, with the current tool sets. We have to look outside of them or at least know that it's not going to take place. Now, I'm getting very interested in things like media mix modeling tools, which I know there's very big limitations of from a data point of view to the world that we live in, but the concepts of causality and lag time and incremental lift, they're, all, they're, they're logical ideas. And I think people are coming to the ideas. There's just a really big difficulty in we're using a really very limited tool set. The best example I heard of it, it's like trying to measure climate change using a thermometer. It's just not going to give you the full picture. And more and more of what I'm seeing is that when you look at other tools, and again, I'm not advocating purely for those tools, but I am. what I'm seeing is that the story seems to be confirming that most of the value of marketing is not captured within those tools. So we're actually selling marketing short and when you look at big companies, at least, and look at their data sets, what I've seen in those data is that often the things like the brand refresh may not work in six months, but it might work in 19 months, by which time the CMO is gone. So a lot of the marketing works better than we think it does, takes longer than we want it to, and we're measuring it with a very limited view. And I think that's a really big problem that is not easy to solve. Yes. And I think it's... You know, like we'll even just take the Refined Labs point of view on this, right? Because I think he's been talking about it the longest, this idea of the dark funnel. And especially now that companies won't have these crazy unlimited budgets because finally we're being responsible, I think we have to rethink how we build brands and really looking at, you know, where do our, going back to people, where do our people live? How, who, who, who are they influenced by? Like, reorienting to more of a, a LinkedIn influencer strategy or community-based strategies, partnerships, like being more creative with how you, you show up in a more efficient way. Again, I'll go back to brand consistency is king here. So how you show up is, is what matters, but maybe we have to change the mix of where we show up and what we're asking our end users to do and trying to do that in a more efficient way. And so I think it's going to challenge all of us to, to rethink how we build brands in the future. It, it's not dumping millions of dollars into ads. Um, I think you have to be, that's why Sam, I kind of go on the TAM question. Like, I don't know if we can afford that. Uh, you know, do we have to be more segmented and be like, okay, I'm going to run a brand campaign to this segment of my ICP. And I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to make sure I show up and the message is consistent. It's helpful. And when is there a podcast when Gong doesn't get mentioned? So I will mention Gong. And so what I loved about what they did is they picked a persona. They picked not the buyer persona. They picked the user persona and they served the seller. From day one, that's where all that content went. And I saw Devin on your podcast, big fan. And so like pick, be specific as to who you're building your brand for and going all in on that and then finding where they live and being consistent in the way that you're serving them, I think is the path to the future versus billboard ads on the 101 and flush, you know, like display ads everywhere you can put it. I just, it's not efficient. It's not going to work. I also think what I'd add to that is it's also really important to, figure out how they want to buy. What I One of the biggest problems, and I've made this mistake when I came in as a VP of marketing in-house, was that I signed up for the task of, hey, all of it is outbound right now. We want it to be inbound by the end of next year. And that may not be the right thing where you're trying to divert 
and create a new channel that is the contributor of all of the pipeline. Sometimes that may be the best path. Like I've often heard it where events are where people buy in certain industries. That's the reality. It may be better to make that channel more effective by amplifying who has heard of it, how they've heard of it, rather than saying events is too efficient. We want to shift to LinkedIn to being the channel. Like you have to follow the path that they buy and partnerships are really effective, especially for companies with limited budget and limited brand awareness, piggyback off of the people who already have it, use it to your advantage. Share your customer bases. Absolutely. Share your event, you know, like, yeah. And I think the the problem is that I think the, uh, one of my biggest gripes with SaaS has become that marketing is judged by its contribution, not its impact. And that's the wrong way of looking at it. If sales got better because marketing showed up, then everybody wins, but marketing has to be doing better at contributing pipeline than sales. And that's the wrong mentality. I'm trying to decide which rabbit hole I want to go down <laughs> what you two were just sharing for the past five minutes here. I'm also surprised it took 40 minutes of recording for Liam to say my biggest gripe in B2B SaaS. I thought we'd hit that in like five minutes in. <laughs> That's so true. So one of my favorite things about where we work is we look at our, our sales and marketing, we just call it the GTM team. We don't get caught up in the attribution side of it. And how we know our marketing is working better is before we started, BDRs would call 60 hours a day, you know, the good old fashioned predictable revenue model machine. And people would be like, who are you? What do you do? You know, that old thing. And then two years later, now when the BDRs call people like, oh, Loxo, I know what you do. They they give us the pitch back. Our CEO still does the founder led sales. And people, I said, Matt, give us a year of being on the podcast. You're going to go from people are going to ask you about the company and everything else to getting on demos with you and be like, I know you already. I know what you're going to say. And they're going to try to sell themselves on why they're a customer for you versus why you have to sell them. And that Liam is exactly what I think good marketing does on the sales side. Again, yeah, you can't, it's not going to show up in a visible model. It's not going to show up anywhere else, but those, the interpersonal sales side and the growth of the company, I think those are the inflection points where it makes the job easier for BDRs. It makes the job easier on the disco where you don't have to do the full, like, here's what we do. Here's our, our origin story, but like they get it already. So they understand whether it's a unique point of view or just at least like what you do and how it can benefit them. I think that is a, to your point, like a very untangible result of good marketing that you can never measure that quantitatively. A hundred percent. So Sam, in the early days when you're pushing this strategy and you're trying to get your CEO on board, what are some of the metrics that you're looking at to prove this out? And then I'll ask Liam and Sydney the same question because their experience is a little bit later stage than where you're at right now. So... I'll do quantitative ones. I'll do qualitative ones. So quantitative ones are going to be like the first quarter. Like you have to give these things times. These are not light switch. You can just go and start doing brand awareness, start doing demand creation, start doing lead gen, whatever it is. Like it's all going to take time if you're doing it properly. So I, I say in the first quarter, all right, what are we going to look at? We've got our baseline of whether you did nothing before or something before, but just understand, you know, get your historicals and then say, okay, since we started doing this quarter later, are we seeing new users come to our website, but not just new users, because you could pay for those for content syndication, you can get those for pennies on the dollar. I look at people who are coming with direct as their source or organic as the source, because they're choosing to find us, right? They're not being paid to, to insert our funnel. Um, I look at high intent pages, namely like the pricing page, the demo page, are more people coming and looking at those because they're only going to look at that if there is some type of curiosity, at least like, oh, what could this look like for us? Is there any interest there? So those are the two on the website side in the first 90 days. And I say like, hey, there's cherries on top. If we do start to get an increase in like hand raisers, the high intent hand raisers, like I want to talk to sales. I want to try your product. So that's the first 90 days. And I say the first half of the year, we should start to see a little bit more of the down funnel impact to that. Are your conversion rates going better from lead to opportunity? Are the conversations starting to get easier with the sales team on those fronts? So those are the very hard data points that I'll look at. Refine Labs methodology, we still ask, how'd you hear about us? And it's fascinating to get responses there because so many different things that won't show up in any attribution model are surfaced there. And that's not to give it credit, but it's just to understand what's working for us. Like, where are these places that are, that are working? So Sydney, I know you said you worked at like Vanta before, like go run LinkedIn ads for the IT security audience. They're not on LinkedIn. Good luck. Like you can push millions of dollars there and it, like, it'll work somewhat, but it's a lot harder than for the marketing sales recruiting crowd. You, you have to know where you should be spending your time. Like, yes, you should absolutely know who, but where is the second most important part of that? So 
are the channels that we're pushing harder in, especially like when I tell my CEO, hey, go post more on LinkedIn because that's where our audience spends our time. Let's go get on this podcast. Like, again, there's no direct UTM link that you can click on after listening to a podcast to say, I want to go talk to them. So marrying all of those together is how I was basically able to say like, hey, here's what's working. Here's what we were betting on. And then this is panning out. This isn't working. Here's what we're tweaking. Here's what we're killing. And just continuing to iterate off of that. Honestly, just communicating that was the biggest part of keeping their trust. It wasn't so much as saying like, here's the game plan, 90 days in, exactly what we're going to do for the next two years to hit our hyper growth goals. It's no, just this worked, this didn't, this failed, this, this, you know, like how does it evolve? That's what they care about the most is just knowing that you're working towards that. And that's how I was able to tell that story and, and keep us on the track of him saying, okay, like this is working for us. Keep doing what you're doing. Sydney, how does that compare to what you've done at uh, all the different late stage startups that you've worked at? I'm going to be way more tactical. I think when, when the question was like, how do you convince your CEO? And to me, it's understanding what they care about. And so uh, at Salesloft, it was, you know, showing up on LinkedIn, LinkedIn followers, uh, his personal brand on LinkedIn. And so that's where we spent time. We, you know, spend half an hour every week working on his post strategy and, like getting that those that that connection, it's similar with Godard at, at G two. Like you know, he, he, where he wants to see the brand, I make sure that we're working on that because that's meaningful to them. A lot of times, it's meaningful to the board as well. You know, put them in your campaigns so they're seeing your work, and then when it gets mentioned back to them from people they're talking to, oh, I saw that thing. Like that is the the soft side that gives the validation when they're seeing it and hearing it from the people that influence them. So I always put that into the equation of like brand building is making sure like, is my, are the people that I need to convince seeing that? And then doing all the reports in terms of influencers and followers and like, you know, the, the reach statistics and making sure you do a baseline ahead of time before you start investing in brands. So you can show that, especially to the finance person. I think, you know, when you're talking about brand, you also have to have the CFO in mind and making sure they're educated and aware of what the investment's going to pan out and what to expect to see from that. One of the things that I did at sales often, I get to work with Chad Gold again now at G2, uh, so I guess it worked, was, you know, the same question that we always get, which is my least favorite question from the board. Uh, if I gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? Like, I hate that question. I absolutely hate that question. And um, and so, you know, I think when they asked it, I said, I don't want it. Don't give it to me yet. I haven't built the engine that confidently will tell me, like, where this investment then generate revenue, you know, this much revenue, which is what I care about. I help the company generating revenue until the engine is built consistently. And I know, and I can start to predict by tweaking dials, which by the way, takes like a couple of years to build. Then I'll ask for it is my answer. When I'm ready, I'll ask for it. And we did. We, after the brand refresh, we had built all the engines and we did a whole Shark Tank pitch to our CFO and said, give us a million dollars. This is what it will generate in terms of, of awareness and demand creation and revenue. And we delivered 120% on that goal. And so I could go ask for it again. And so I think, you know, but that takes time, that takes trust, that takes all those other pieces. But going back to your question, it's like, understand what they care about, your CEO, your CFO, orchestrate for them and then still have to deliver on on your goals i like that you said you wait you waited on that because liam earlier was saying that building the brand awareness that drives inbound is inefficient to me that's always the most efficient side that's where you get the the low cac the the great payback periods and so when you start to add in the paid dollars the heavy paid dollars that it gets wildly inefficient pretty quick and so i always tell people i'm like you can't spend your way to product market fit like this is no everyone knows that but if you have a really strong brand base and then you ask for that million dollars, like that's where, yeah, Sydney, you probably could have grown your company at, at a relative quip, 120%. Absolutely not. But when you have that strong base beforehand and then you layer in the, the demand creation side, adding the paid dollars into some of that, that to me is the, the magic part of where it happens. So it's almost like you have to have, to your point, like the fundamentals, you have to have those all in place if you want to do the rest properly yeah. and, and truly scale over time. I mean... I my I don't want to downplay previous companies, but it's like I walked in and I was like, "Holy shit, we're spending how much?" Like to and we, and we were treating brand awareness as demand capture, and it was just like bananas. But we did have product market fit. We did have a very strong competitor, but it was so inefficient. And and I was looking, you know, where you see 
like as soon as you start inspecting the buying journey or like, okay, well, what happens when somebody hand raises, like how many of those actually show up and convert to leads? And, and then, and then if you put math next to it, you're like, okay, you've, you've asked us to spend this much to generate this much pipeline and then put a dollar figure on, oh, the 30% no show rate on first meeting booked. That's how much we wasted. So do you think we should go fix that now? Like, you know, chase after those, like, and it, it's just like this, you know, you just see money kind of flowing outside of, of, and, and it's just, you, and so I think if you're trying to help people understand, if you have the good fortune of being in a situation where you have money, to, <laughs> that much money to spend, like, just take it back to the dollars and, you know, like why we need to pull back. And, and it's hard because, you know, you're growing at a, a fast clip and it's all being funneled through the investments that you're making. Um, but it's crazy and efficient. And it's just like, as a leader, it's not sustainable. And so how do you raise your hand and be like, this, this isn't going to work and pulling in the CFO and the CEO and trying to be way more efficient. I mean, I, I pulled back too hard. I'll again, like failures are lessons. You know, when I came in, I was just like, we are like, I just want to cut money out and give it back to finance right away. And it was too fast. So the Google algorithm didn't like that and punished us for it. Um, and then we had to build it back. So I do it differently, but still, I think, you know, as leaders, we come in and you see like the map and you're like, this, this is not sustainable. So we are just about at time. Liam, any final thoughts on that last question? I would agree with everything that was said. I think that tactically I I'm completely on the same page as that. What, what I would add is just that. I think that a lot of what we often don't get time to do is like, I think there's the show what was clearly not working and cut that wasted spend of things like Google ads and things that are well talked about on LinkedIn. But I think the other bigger problem is make sure that marketing is articulating what problem it is specifically trying to solve. I've always said that salespeople are extremely good at identifying marketing problems because they're the ones who face the realities of it. They are, however, very bad at diagnosing the solution to that problem because you ask them what they're dealing with and they'll go, they don't know who we are. They think we do something else. They think we're way cheaper than we actually were. It's really problematic. And then you go, okay, and how would we solve that? And they'll usually say, case studies, send me to more events, give me more leads. In reality, you have to try and back up a lot of what I spend my time doing is challenging the, well, where is that consideration set actually being developed? How far back is that really happening? And are you doing things to address that problem? Because that's the real problem that will cause long-term impact. It's too easy to optimize towards end of funnel efficiency, and you should start there because you need those wins for sure, but you can't end there. And that I think is the other piece. If you find inefficiencies, reallocate them towards longer-term thinking, but know what those are. All right. So last question, Sydney, this has absolutely nothing to do with anything that we talked about, but you were just in my city last week and we love eating in Chicago. What was the best thing that you ate in Chicago while you were here last week? Oh my goodness. Um, mashed potatoes. Uh -oh. <laughs> I've had everything. I had like a twice baked potato at like, oh, it's a steakhouse. that starts with a G. Uh, Gibson's. Gibson's. Oh, and I didn't order a, a steak. I'm like, oh, I want to go light. Answer. I'll just have a potato. <laughs> and it was this giant, like, stuffed baked potato. It was, like, crazy good. But, yeah, probably not as healthy as I was hoping it to be. <laughs> you can't Amazing. go to the Midwest and not get a, a very hearty potato. I can yes. tell you that. <laughs> Well, this was awesome. We uh, went long, but it's because I enjoyed the conversation so much. Thank you uh, for joining me on The Proof Point. This was a blast. 